time. I, I know this is a, a, a great day and then we get to spend a lot of time thinking about corals and coral reefs with the seminar speaker, Katie. Katie. And uh, now with our uh, distinguished visitor, who's a distinguished professor at James Cook University, uh, Dr. Terry Hughes. Uh, it's uh, terrific to have the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation be able to welcome Dr. Hughes to Scripps to give a seminar. As and then he is uh, something of an embodiment or a, a, a terrific um, demonstration of what uh, science can and should be in society. Having, uh, beyond the many laurels, one of the things that I find most inspiring about Dr. Hughes is his uh, marriage of fundamental science with uh, communication of that science, transmitting that science, thinking thoughtfully about making sure that the knowledge that the academy has is out there in the hands of users. Uh, that battle is something that I don't think that you would necessarily say has been an easy one day in and day out. Uh, blood, sweat, tears, probably a story for each one of those uh, bodily fluids. Uh, but uh, something where the, you are seeing some real impact happen. Uh, Terry's a, an inspiration to many of us, and it's uh, terrific to welcome him here to Scripps. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Hughes. consuming for me and my colleagues, uh, not just in Australia, but coral reef researchers around uh, the world, because we've just witnessed the third uh, pan-tropical uh, coral bleaching event, and I'll talk quite a bit about that uh, today. So to put you in the mood, uh, we'll start with, I think it doesn't work. <laughs> Um, so here's a very pretty picture uh, of, of a, a coral reef. Um, now when I look at that picture, um, I can read a little bit about the history of this location because the dominant corals in this picture are these table-shaped acropora. The genus acropora dominates in the Pacific reefs. It's fast growing. It either makes staghorn tall branching corals, a few in this picture, or it can make these uh, rapidly growing uh, plates. These things grow at about 15 to 20 centimeters radial growth uh, per annum. So almost all the corals in that picture are 10 years old or less. Um, and it's quite a low diversity. Uh, this is Acropora isolates. So this site was disturbed about a decade ago, most likely by coral bleaching or possibly by an outbreak of transformed starfish. And it's since been uh, recolonized with a very high coral color. And that's a dynamic which I'll come back to later in the talk in terms of the resilience of reefs and their capacity to recover from recurrent disturbances. So I'll be talking today about uh, climate change. There are various elements of climate change. In particular, today I'll be talking about global warming heat waves. I, I tend to avoid the term heat waves. Uh, it's become quite uh, when I was a postdoctoral fellow at uh, UC Santa Barbara. Uh, the lower border has flown under the proverbial bridge. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk today about global warming and coral reefs. Uh, this is an issue which has been all consuming for me and my colleagues, uh, not just in Australia, but coral reef researchers around uh, the world because we've just witnessed the third uh, pan-tropical uh, coral bleaching event, and I'll talk quite a bit uh, about that uh, today. So to put you in the mood, uh, we'll start with a trickle that doesn't work. Here we go. I guess I'll have to use the keyboard. Um, so here's a very pretty picture uh, when I was a postdoctoral fellow at uh, UC Santa Barbara, uh, a lot of 
water has flown under the proverbial bridge. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk today about global warming and coral reefs. Uh, this is an issue which has been all consuming for me and my colleagues, uh, not just in Australia, but coral reef researchers around uh, the world, because we've just witnessed the third uh, pan tropical. Uh, coral bleaching event, and I'll talk quite a bit about that uh, today. So, to put you in the mood, um, start with. I think it doesn't work. Here we go. I guess I'll have to use the keyboard. Um, so, here's a very pretty picture. Um, that's the flight path that, that I took. It takes about eight days to crisscross the Great Barrier in a small plane uh, or a helicopter. I'm not quite sure whether that's jumping like that. That's what bleaching looks like from uh, 150 feet in the air in a helicopter. So all the white and yellow you can see there is basically dying corals uh, on shallow reefs on the Great Barrier Reef. If you go underwater, a severely bleached reef looks like this. I'm sorry, that's jumping, it shouldn't be. This is a coral which is dying. It's starting to be colonized by filamentous algae. Most of this coral is acropora that we show also on the first pretty picture. Uh, as I said, it's the dominant genus. There's more dying coral being colonized by filamentous algae. One of the things that shocked us with uh, our initial surveys of coral bleaching underwater was that 25% of the corals died in a week. We had a similar level of mortality over the following eight months. Now, they're not supposed to die suddenly. The, the, let me explain what bleaching is. Bleaching is a stress response by the corals where the symbiotic relationship between the coral hive and symbiotic microalgae is often fairly breaks down. So the the vernacular in the literature is that the corals die slowly because they've got two fusos in the belly. They die of starvation because a bleached coral is nutritionally compromised. We certainly did find that in the longer term. But half of the corals that died in 2016 did so within a week or two. They didn't die slowly of starvation, but they could because the temperatures were so extreme. Again, I'm avoiding the term heat wave. Um, now, I'm sure you've seen, all of you, lots of graphs with temperature or temperature anomaly against time, and you're familiar with the blue bars that turn into the red bars um, due to anthropogenic global warming. This one's a little bit different in that the symbols here represent different stages of enso cycles. So, as you will all know, uh, El Nino's tend to be somewhat warmer at global or regional scale, and La Nina is a little bit cooler with enzo neutral years in between. So this is sea surface temperature for one degrees latitude and longitude pixels throughout the <coughs> tropics where those pixels contain coral reefs from the 1870s to the present day. The two colored envelopes here are the the 95% uh, confidence limits around the trajectory for El Nino's and La Nina's. And what it basically said is that temperatures are getting warmer, which won't surprise any of you. They're getting warmer throughout ENSO cycles. But what I think is surprising is that sea surface temperatures today, during cooler La Nina periods, are now hotter than they were during El Nino's 30 or, four, 30 or 40 years ago. The significance of that is we've now gone through three phases in the recent history of underwater extreme temperatures and resulting bleaching events. And they pretty much mirror the 40 year length of my career. So prior to the early 1980s, and we have El Nino events on an irregular cycle every five years or so, we had no regional or global scale. And if, we, if they had occurred in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, up to the early 80s, we would have noticed. So the first regional scale bleaching event was recorded in the eastern Pacific 
specific to parts of Southeast Asia, uh, but not in the Caribbean, not, not in the Pacific larger or the Indian Ocean. Uh, during a very strong El Nino, the first global event was in 1998. So we went from an initial period with no regional or, or global scale bleaching events to an interim period where El Ninos became dangerous for coral reefs because they could trigger bleaching. And then in the more recent decades, we've seen more and more mass bleaching events at a regional scale in other parts of the peninsula cycle. So the Great Barrier Reef has bleached four times. I'll show you that in a moment. Two of those bleaching events were during El Nino periods, and two of them were not. Um, so the consequence of that is that the return time between the years of our current bleaching events is shrinking. We don't have to wait for the gap between one El Nino and the next, because it, they're now occurring throughout the Enzo cycle. So this is a map of the world that uh, I published uh, last year in science, there are 100 dots on this map. They show the severity of bleaching during the third global coral bleaching event in 2015 and 2016. So the first global bleaching event was in 1998. That was a real wake-up call for most people in the coral reef science community. It's when most people first saw bleaching, uh, those who were all around the world. Um, the second one was in 2010, when about half of the world's coral reefs bleached, and again for the third time in 2015-16. So, uh, 70 of those 100 dots on this map are red, indicating that um, at least 30% uh, of the corals bleached. Uh, of these events is increasing, and the gap between them uh, is getting, getting shorter. And that's shown here. So if we look at our country locations through time, this is a sort of a depletion curve for severe bleachings in black and total bleachings uh, in, in blue. It's basically the number of locations that remain unbleached up to the present day. So of those 100 locations, only six have not yet severely bleached. And that's important because conservation biologists put a lot of store into identifying spatial refuges, the special places that won't bleach. Well, we're running out of them. The world is full of potential spatial refuges that are, we now know, are not spatial refuges because they finally bleach. That big drop there is the 98 bleach event. And even those places that have not yet severely bleached have all bleached mildly. So the number of refuges that have never bleached including the mild bleaching events, is now zero. And so, of those 100 locations, we've now recorded 300 severe events. So on average, each place has, has experienced three to four severe bleaching events. The Great Barrier has now had four, so that's pretty typical. And if we include the milder events, then they've on average had six bleaching events, severe plus mild in total. Um, there's a distribution around those figures, which you can see in this science paper published in January last year. Um, some places, like parts of French Polynesia, have now had eight severe bleaching events since the 1980s, and as I said, six have zero bleaching events. Okay, bleaching has now become so routine that we can have, we have a variety of tools that make bleaching forecasts. Uh, so this is one from Australia, from the Australian Bureau of Meteorology. Um, it shows uh, a forecast issued in March 2016 uh, for severe temperatures in the following months. In Australia, temperatures peak in the middle of March, and so bleaching tends to occur from then onwards, peaking in early April, and then as temperatures drop, uh, the bleaching slowly subside over a period of maybe six months. So these are temperature anomalies. So 2016 was a record-breaking year for sea surface temperatures on the Great Barrier Reef, which go back uh, in the records to the 1890s. And 2017 was even hotter. Uh, so Bomb was screaming at us, it's going to bleach, it's going to bleach. And so was uh, NOAA. So this is NOAA's forecast of 
issue for the following year, 2017, uh, showing severe bleaching uh, was likely to occur on the Great Barrier Reef. In fact, most of the southern hemisphere. Um, those forecasts don't always come to pass. Um, sometimes they're trumped by local weather. So a well-timed cyclone um, can often um, make a likely bleaching event uh, not eventuate because it stirs up the water column, lots of cloud cover, rain, and so on, brings the temperature back down. When NOAA issues these forecasts, um, they're accompanied by what they call an advisory, which says um, if the temperatures exceed uh, a metric called four degree heating weeks, so I'll explain in a second, then bleaching will start uh, and get more severe as the heat exposure goes up. And by the time you reach eight degree heating weeks, mortality will start. So a degree heating week is basically a metric of heat exposure. It combines the duration of high temperatures times the degree centigrade above the normal summer maximum temperature for that location. So four degree heating weeks is one degree above the long-term summer maximum that lasts a month. Or eight degree heating weeks is two degrees above the long-term summer maximum that lasts a month. And in the Great Barrier Reef in 2016 and 2017, we saw degree heating week exposures of 12, 14, 16 degrees. So the Barrier Reef has now bleached four times. Uh, 98 was a strong El Nino year, but 2002 was in some control. 2016 was another El Nino year, 2017 was in some neutral, uh, bordering on La Nina conditions. So we don't need an El Nino anymore. We were sort of unlucky for this era to have only a four year gap. And we were incredibly lucky to have a 14 year gap between 2002 and 2016, and then dreadfully unlucky to have the first incidents of a back-to-back bleaching then in, in the last two years. So the climate modelers are telling us with business as usual emissions, we could see back-to-back -back bleaching events, what we just experienced every year, uh, in about 30 or 40 years' time, if greenhouse gases uh, continue to be emitted at the, at the current level. We're very lucky in Australia to have these two maps. So the 1998 event caught everyone with their pants down because we never experienced it. And we didn't learn very much between then and 2004. So there's only a handful of papers that are published on these two earlier uh, events. Uh, there's this one by a guy called Ray Berkowitz, who's now long retired. But Ray had the initiative to get into a small plane and to survey the extent of bleaching in both of those events. And the other significant paper, for those of you who work on corals, is two papers by Baird and Marshall and Marshall and Baird, where they looked at uh, a phenomenon called winners and losers, which is differential bleaching. They just it doesn't. And I'll come back to that issue in a moment. Um, so Ray came up with this bleaching score scheme where green is good, little or no bleaching, and red and orange are bad, uh, severe levels of bleaching, enough to cause uh, some level of mortality, although Ray didn't measure the mortality. He also didn't ground truth the accuracy of these scores, but nonetheless, these are very valuable. You can see from these maps that the footprint of bleaching in both years is different. So the first event was primarily coastal, and the north was not affected. And the second one, there was more bleaching offshore, and again, there was a lot of green, healthy reefs in the, in the far north. So when bleaching recurred in 2016, 14 years after this second bleaching event, I decided that we would redo Gray's aerial scores and we would use the same scoring system so that we could uh, compare the footprint of the maps that he measured with the new footprint. I used a helicopter. Uh, we left the back doors in a sugarcane paddock. Um, that was our air conditioning. Uh, we flew for 30 hours in this thing. It was like something you get out of a Christmas card. Um, it's up to the 
crash. Um, but no one, no one fell in um, So that squiggle there is about eight hours flying. Um, this is another six hours flying. And then we used to fix when paragraph, which I don't think is safer. Um, and that's what bleaching looks like from the air. Uh, I'm not sure if you've been to it uh, before. We also did an enormous amount of work underwater. So while well, I was cruising around slightly terrified in a small helicopter, we had about 100 people underwater for a month. And we did all sorts of stuff. So the aerial stuff is really good for getting the big picture. Where is the bleaching? Where is, where is, where is it the most severe? And we can ask the question, why? Um, underwater, we can measure the bleaching as well. Uh, to ground truth the aerial scores, we can also identify the corals and look at species-specific patterns of bleaching and mortality. And we went back to many of those these locations repeatedly after the peak of the bleaching to look at what happened next. This graph here is basically uh, the calibration curve to ground truth the accuracy of our aerial scores. So these are the five scores that we use from no bleaching to more than 60% of the corals bleached. And if you look at where the medians lie, <coughs> the bottom one is incredibly accurate. Um, so, uh, the picture on the left shows what the bleached corals looks like in the water along that transect. Okay, the six maps here, the three on top show the bleaching patterns that we measured. Let me explain that first. Um, so these are the two historic maps that we have, and I mentioned that in 98, most of the bleaching was coastal. So this is a heat map, no pun intended, of all of the colored dots that you saw uh, earlier. In 2002, some of the bleaching moved offshore, and in both years, the northern extreme of the Great Barrier, up towards the heat, um, was green. So at this point in time, we thought, Maybe the most remote, most pristine part of the Great Barrier is a spatial refuge. We didn't bleach either at the time, and in 2016, why not? Um, so the northern half of the Great Barrier was severely bleached in the 30th century. This portion of the reefs, the corals turned pale in February, and then uh, on the 20th of February, the Category 5 cyclone passed over Fiji. I call them Winston. It came to southern Queensland about a week later and sat there for two or three weeks. And it brought the temperatures down by 2 degrees centigrade and basically rescued the great southern half of the Great Barrier. So a weak cyclone, at that point it was a rent depression with a very precise timing. Uh, it, was, it was very useful in terms of alleviating what would have been uh, GBR wide. Um, and Noah had predicted that the whole barrier was going to be um, The three maps on the bottom are the degree heating and heat exposure graphs. We get this data through our collaboration with Noah. This is satellite data. So blue is cold according to the satellites, and red is hot. And you can see that for each of the three events, <coughs> it's a really good fit. And we can do the regressions, so it's very good. Um, between where the water is hottest for longest and where the bleaching occurs. And uh, in a moment I'll show you how those foot footprints overlap through time uh, to determine the cumulative impact of multiple bleaching. This is data from underwater. So the map shows reefs where we measured bleaching underwater, uh, which we can do um, more precisely than from the air. But it's obviously a lot more labor intensive. Um, and so each dot here represents a reef, which is mapped on the right. And this is the thermal exposure in degree heating weeks that each of those reefs had. And this is the percent bleach that we measured on transects uh, crawling along the bottom. Um, so you remember Noah's advisory that bleaching spells should start at four degree heating weeks. Well, we found it actually starts at two. Um, so this is uh, sort of a response curve by the coral assemblages. By the time you get to four, when bleaching is supposed to start, on average we were getting close to 40% of the corals were bleaching. 
And we have a similar uh, calibration curve for mortality, which I'll show you in, in a moment. Um, so we went back to many of these same reefs, uh, 68 of them, uh, and measured uh, the response of the corals in terms of their survivorship. So this is a severe breach reef eight months later. It looks like a graveyard. So all you can see here is Acrophora. That is a massive Parites coral in the background, which survived. Parites are tough. They, they, they grow slowly over the whole surface. <coughs> they can live for several centuries. And if you want to live to be 400 years old, you've got to be able to deal with all sorts of stressors. So they're tougher corals than these Acrophora. It's unusual to see an intact stand of corals like this. Um, mortality from cyclones obviously breaks them up. Um, you can sometimes see dead intact corals that have been sucked dry of their tissue by granitone or starfish, but not at the scale of 700 kilometers, which was the red region in 2016, the Great Barrier Reef. Um, if you're a baby coral, settling on this is really bad. I Sooner or later, a cyclone will come, and this will be turned into water. So we went back after eight months. Um, we calculated uh, the mortality for the whole Great Barrier if using our aerial scores. So these are the reefs where we measured mortality underwater. We have an aerial score for each of those reefs, which means that we can convert the amount of mortality we measured and produce this sort of calibration curve. So a reef which had category four bleaching, more than 60% of the corals killed, had a median mortality of about 60%. In other words, when bleaching is really severe, almost all of the corals die. So using that calibration curve, we were able to convert our 1,156 aerial bleaching scores into a mortality estimate and then do a heat map of the um, mortality pattern at the scale of the Great Barrier Reef. And it looks like this. So, uh, and here again is the thermal exposure of the Greenland reefs. And again, you can see there's a good um, correspondence between these two. These two are calculated completely independently um, of each other. But basically, what it says is where the reef was hottest then that's where the mortality was. I forgot to remind you of the scale of this thing. I showed this map at the ESA meeting in New Orleans a couple of months ago. I pointed out that if this was New Orleans, then Chicago's about here, and Quebec was at the top. Right? So it's 2,300 um, kilometers. That's why it takes eight days in a small airplane um, to crisscross the length and breadth of it. We also measured um, um, the degree meaning weeks of the individual reefs where we work underwater. So each of these dots is a reef where we've measured underwater the amount of loss of coral cover between March and October, an eight month period, as a function of the degree heat week exposure of each of those reefs. You can see this nonlinear relationship. So at zero degree heating, we have no heat exposure in the south. Um, we've got no change in cover. As the heat exposure uh, increased, by the time we got to four, which is where NOAA says bleaching might start, we actually have 45% mortality. Now, there, there are some, many reasons why that might be the case. One is these coral assemblages were quite naive in terms of the history of their heat exposure. They had a 14 year gap between the last bleaching event in 2002, and in that year, there was no heat exposure in the far north where a lot of this high mortality was coming from. By the time you get to six degree heating weeks, we've got um, something like 60% mortality, and at eight and above, we have catastrophic mortality of 62. Um, there's quite a lot of variance around that bit of time. Um, some of that is likely due to the assemblage structure. So a reef which has a higher than average acropora, and they're the ultimate losers, uh, 
would have higher mortality, would have obese with more uh, varieties, the top corals uh, might have less mortality. So let's talk about the winners and the losers. So I'll give you an example of Acropora, is a dead stand, and the slow growing tough, long living species and varieties. This coral is bleached. And that's why we took a photograph of it, because the varieties rarely bleaches. And when it does, it almost always uh, regains its color, although in 2016 and 17, we did see some large varieties like this uh, bleach and subsequently die. Uh, a more conventional way on the right of showing the spectrum <coughs> of winners and losers. So the further axon is to the right here, the more resistant it was to bleaching. So staghorn and Acropora was special dominant, but also by far the most sensitive. Um, a more conventional way of showing it is here. This is percent mortality for these 17 years. Uh, so in the literature, people talk a lot about winners and losers, but almost, almost all of that literature is winners and losers in terms of who bleached and who didn't. Whereas this is the ultimate loser. This is who died or who survived. Um, most of the published winners and losers graphs for bleaching are steeper than this. This is quite a flat one. Um, so this is for the red reefs, which were primarily in the northern half of the Great Barrier. And basically everything is bleaching with the exception of this last category, somewhere between 80 and 70. Uh, percent. Uh, so um, there's no real winners. Winners and losers is a relative term. So if half of you dies compared to 90 percent of you <laughs> dies, um, you could argue whether that's really win. Uh, <laughs> um, we also looked at the shift in the composition of the assemblage and we looked at the functional consequences of that. I have a pretty good time today to show you that. So this axis here is delta uh, composite species composition. So it's before, after shift measured with the multivariate uh, analysis and NDS, uh, where we plotted the shift in the assemblage from before bleaching to afterwards as a function of the degree heating we exposure. Um, so very low levels of heat heat exposure meant that the assemblage stayed the same. But above a sort of tipping point of about six, we've got this disproportionate shift, a change in the slope of the relationship, where basically the composition collapsed because of the more or less complete elimination of Acropora, which are the special dominant. But Acropora is the worst loser, but everything else is losing as well. So six degrees, 29% of the individual reefs on the Great Barrier Reef, there's about 3,000 of them, had a heat exposure of six or more. And basically those reefs have collapsed or transformed or been half destroyed, use whatever term you like. But they are unrecognizable with an average coral cover of maybe 3% uh, compared to more like 40%. For the okay, I told you earlier that we could superimpose the maps of the bleaching events. So that's uh, Ray Berkelman's first map from 98, the uh, 2002 map. Uh, so that's all the dots that uh, Ray Berkelman collected. Sorry, I correct myself. This only shows the last two bleaching categories, the red and the orange. So red is more than 60% of the coral bleach, orange is 30 to 60. And at this point in time, we thought that the north was a special refuge. But we will I add 2016. So 2016 was off the chart in terms of the severity of the event. Um, the overall mortality that we measured for the Great Barrier in 2016 was 30%. Uh, the Great Barrier Green Park Authority measured it a different way uh, using our data and some data of their own, and they came up with 29%. <laughs> uh, we're not going to argue that. Um, and now I'll add uh, the recent bleaching event, and you won't really see much difference. 
uh, there's a little bit more red up here here. You don't see much difference because at this point in time, many of these reefs are severely bleaching for the second or third time. So we now have good information on how many reefs have never bleached, bleached once, bleached twice, bleached three times or four times. I don't have time to show you that. But basically, if you're going to bleach uh, two or more times, you need to be in this region because that's where the footprints for the four bleaching beds overlap um, the most. Okay, I want to change tack now a little bit. Um, so these are the two bleaching maps. You've seen this one along with the 2002 and 2008. This is our latest one. So bleaching in 2017 was primarily in the middle of the Great Barrier. Um, 2017 was even hotter uh, than 2016. So between these two events, fully two thirds of the Great Barrier, that's a distance of about a thousand miles or 1,500 kilometers from the tip of Cape York to south of the down to about here, in this map. Um, have now been severely bleached and the south escaped twice due to the vagaries of weather. We had a second cyclone in 2017, the cyclone track was like that. It came too late. Uh, it came about three weeks after the bleaching and it actually added to the problem because it wasn't a spent cyclone that it had before um, and it caused quite a lot of damage to the southern Great Barrier Reef. So we had a 14-year gap between 2016 and the earlier period. We showed that the history of heat exposure in 20, 20, 2002 didn't make any difference to the bleaching scores in 2016 because there was enough time for the assemblages to uh, recover. But it's a different story for a back-to-back -back bleaching event. So we had the opportunity to ask uh, whether the memory of 2016 affected the outcome of bleaching in 2017. So the, um, the issue we're looking at here is something uh, which you find scattered in the <coughs> ecological literature, mainly theoretical. It's about the ability of the past to influence the present trajectory of ecosystems. Um, and we argued in a paper published in Nature Climate Change uh, about a month ago, um, that the shrinking gap between pairs of recurrent bleaching events means we no longer have the luxury of studying them as individual events that are independent of each other. They're actually interacting. Mm -hmm. And one of the assumptions of the climate modelers around issues like when will we see back-to-back -back bleaching events on an annual basis in the future makes the implicit assumption that coral reefs will respond to heat exposure in the future the way that they are currently responding to heat exposure. And we show, uh, I'll show you the graph in a minute, but that's not the case. Um, in fact, the response curves, like the bleaching response curve and the mortality response curve that I showed you earlier, were very different in 2017 because the history of exposure of the corals made a huge difference. And that's shown here. So the map on the left is delta three heating weeks, where blue means it was cooler in 2017. So you can see that uh, about 80% of the Great Barrier Reef was hotter in 2017. So another record-breaking year that beat the record-breaking year of 2016, particularly hotter in the middle, where the bleaching in year two was the most extreme. But the north also was significantly uh, hotter in year two. It should have re bleached and it didn't. And the did, reason it didn't re bleach is that dead corals can't bleach twice. So the acropores were pretty much eliminated, leaving the tougher ones behind. So we look at the response curve, the probability of bleaching in 2016 versus 2017 as a function of heat exposure. The curve has shifted quite dramatically to the right. So in 2016, a degree heating week exposure of four meant you'd have 0.4 probability of observing severe bleaching. Um, but to get 0.4 bleaching in 2017, you had to go all the way up to eight. 
And this is another reason why Noah's advisory is that four shock calls bleaching and eight shock calls mortality uh, needs to be taken with a pretty large pinch of salt. And you know, we're well aware of that. They're very uh, interested in our data, and we've been collaborating with these very closely because um, this is probably the best data set they'll ever get um, in terms of testing the accuracy and consequences of what their satellites are, are telling them. So the bottom line here is the assemblage is behaving very differently in year two than it did in year one. Um, in a sense, it's toughened up. Um, the primary mechanism is, uh, for this shift was loss of corals in the north, but we also saw uh, a shift in the heat exposure uh, response uh, in the middle of the reef and in the south of the reef. Um, so what happened in year one really changed the outcome of year two, and that's important in terms of uh, being aware of the increased interaction between pairs of recurrent events as the gap between the shrinks. So let me just sum up uh, what I've said so far, and then I want to show you one last set of data. Um, so the first point is that the impacts of the second heat wave of 2017, which is called the heat wave, extreme temperatures, um, and its footprint were contingent on what happened in 2016, underscoring the need to uh, be aware of the interactions between pairs of events and sequences uh, of events. Um, and finally, reef resilience is increasingly challenged by the emergence of these novel disturbance regimes. Um, so coral reefs and coral life histories have evolved with a particular uh, disturbance regime, in particular um, they are responsive to uh, cyclones or hurricanes with a return time on any individual reef of maybe 30, 35 years. Um, they are not adapted to back-to-back -back bleaching, uh, and they don't have the capacity to move <coughs> down uh, very quickly. It takes about 10 years for the fastest growing corals to make a decent recovery after a major disturbance. So that very pretty picture I showed you at the beginning shows the final stages of that kind of successional sequence, which takes about a decade. And if you've got back to back bleaching, that recovery is not possible. I want to finish up with um, a paper that uh, came out about six hours ago um, in today's issue of Nature. Um, so in the beginning of the 1990s, uh, up to six times, uh, I've measured with my colleagues um, the pattern of replenishment of corals along the length of the Great Barrier Reef. So this is a picture from about 1994. It shows one of many thousands of settlement panels that we've deployed on the Great Barrier Reef, um, surrounded by the adult corals that make the babies which settle on the other surface of these settlement tiles. Um, we bought, uh, I think it was 10,000 of them in 1994, and we've just used the last thousand um, to put them out on the Barrier Reef from north to south uh, in the aftermath of the back-to-back -back, uh, region. So the difference between these two pictures is the plates are the same, but the adult corals in the north and now the central area are very clear. So what we wanted to ask was, what is the impact of the loss of tunnel broodstock on the pattern of recruitment at the scale of the Great Barrier Reef uh, following bleaching? What is the resilience of the Great Barrier Reef in the aftermath? So our, our research now is focusing more on the recoverability of the reef, uh, because we've done all the boom and doom stuff in terms of the impact of, of, the, of the bleaching. So this is figure one in the paper that came out today. This is pre-bleaching recruitment. So the diameter of each circle is proportionate to the density of recruits on the recruitment panels. So historically, most panels had 50 up to 200 uh, small uh, baby corals on their under surfaces when we picked them up after an eight-week deployment. Uh, this is data for 47 reefs in different periods, so the statistical analysis of this looks at uh, different sectors of the Great Barrier Reef, uh, the year of deployment, 
and so on. The wedges are the proportion of corals that are brooders in blue or spawners in yellow. The spawners are overwhelmingly acrophora. Um, let me just explain that for one minute. Um, corals, when they reproduce, can do it in two ways. I'm talking here about sexual reproduction. About 10% of species, primarily fossil corals, produce brooded larvae. Brooded larvae are internally fertilized, so the, the uh, parent colony releases a planula, which is already provisioned with its own belly, and they basically go splat in terms of their dispersal distances. They settle, that's a technical term, they, they settle typically within 12 up to 24 hours on the natal reef. Uh, they're they not widely dispersed, uh, although there is a long tail to the dispersal kernel. Spawners, on the other hand, chuck out their eggs and sperm, chuck out some other technical terms. Um, fertilization is external, and they float around for four to seven days, and they go quite a long way, it tends to a couple of hundred. So the map on the right is what happened in 2018, and you can see that the density of circles has declined on average by 89%. That's a cross-level tax for spawning aquifera, it has declined by 93% at the scale of the Great Barrier Reef, and you probably can't see it here because the circles are too small. But brooders decline less than spawners, a 65% decrease by years compared to a, a 90 something percent decrease by, uh, by the spawners. So for the first time in 1990, sorry, 2018, the pool of baby corals on our settlement panels is dominated by brooders. We've never seen that before. Every time we've done these kinds of deployments before, 80 to 90 percent of the recruits are spawners overwhelmingly agropore. So there's been a huge decrease in the level of replenishment and a shift in the composition. I think I can grab up. Shown here. Okay, so this is on a log scale. So this is what's happened to Acropora, that basically in order of magnitude uh, decrease, much smaller decrease for brooding fossil cores and the other things um, shown shifts as well. Um, so the, the way the Great Barrier Reef is interconnected by larvae has fundamentally changed in the aftermath of the bleacher. So the historical uh, pattern of connectivity was a network of long distance dispersal, primarily the spawners, uh, at the scale of a couple of hundred kilometers. That has now changed to a much tighter network of shorter interconnections. Most of the recruitment that's happening in the wake of the back-to-back -back region is now self-seeding in individual groups. It's basically a different system uh, with a different species composition, both of adults and of juveniles. So what we've seen here is two enormous filters that are changing as we speak and very rapidly the species composition of the Great Barrier. The first filter is on the way down. That's the winners and losers story. Who dies and who survives in various sizes. That has selectively removed a lot of microflora. And the other filters on the way up, the species composition has changed, and that will necessarily have an impact on the adult assemblage that they grow up to be, although it certainly won't be one to one because of differences in survivorship and growth rates. But my point is the historical assemblage structure of the Great Ferry has been shifted, uh, and while resilience is now clearly impaired, comparing the two maps I just showed you, the other issue that we don't have an answer for is what is the system going to return to? It's likely that it will have a greater preponderance of the winners, the ones that can cope with heat stress, but it will also have a greater preponderance of the ones that can bounce back the fastest. As I said, it takes about 10 years for that recovery to take place. And the chances of us not having a fifth bleaching event in that 10 year period is very, very small. So the trajectory that we're on is in a new direction, and it's likely to be truncated uh, within that 10 year time. So to conclude, uh, recurrent bleaching is now the norm on reefs around the world. It's caused about 50% mortality. 
between the two events at the scale of the Great Barrier. That includes the southern third of the Great Barrier where there was no more towing. Uh, the recovery time is almost certainly longer, the 10 year window that I'm talking about, than the return time of the preaching events. The north and the south are going to change forever because there will not be an opportunity to regrow the 50 or 40 or 30 year old corals that we saw dying in 2016 and 2017. But before you leave the room and switch the wrists, <laughs> half the glass is full. That's literally billions of wild corals that are still out there that survived the onslaught of 2016. Um, they're tougher by definition. Uh, but as our latest paper today shows uh, the resilience is impaired. So pretty much everything we thought we knew about how the Great Barrier works is now wrong. Thank you.
So one of my earliest claims to fame was a paper in Science in 1994, which documents the collapse of Jamaican coral reefs. And climate change has nothing to do with it. So many of the corals that survived the beach in the first one especially were battered or bruised and fragmented. So Ripropora doesn't resheat the way that a growing is the normal pasture, whatever they call it. They keep changing its name. Um, so there are actually three mechanisms by which coral cover uh, regrows after a disturbance. Uh, one is obviously um, dispersal and recruitment. Um, and other is the sort of regrowth of the surviving remnants that, that you've described. That's probably the dominant one at the moment on the, on the northern area. Um, but we're only two years into that recovery cycle, so it covers still very long. The third one is the survivorship of corals that settled a year or two before the bleaching, which seem to have come through the bleaching event better than the adults. So those juveniles are often cryptic. They're often on the sides of things, or little nooks and crannies. And so um, they're coming out of growing quite quickly. But we're talking about an increase in cover from 1% to 2% to 4% in the last three years in places like those are known. Um, it's got a long way to go. Um, hopefully those species and genotypes that have survived the two back-to-back -back bleaching events are tougher. Um, I think it's very likely we've just witnessed an enormous natural selection event. Uh, and as I said, there's about a million corals uh, out there. Um, I'm most concerned for the southern barrier reef, which is still a naive system. It's got very high coral cover now, um, typically 15% or more. Uh, it looks like a pretty picture I showed you at the front. It's completely aquapora dominated. And if it gets six, eight, ten, or more degree heating weeks in the next summer, um, it will fly. Um, and then we close the chapter in the very end. Yeah. I have a question about resilience. We had a, a map earlier that showed a bunch of red sort of nestled between them. Is there a sense in, the, in, the, in your community about what is the sort of the, what's the basis for toughness? Is it, I think I showed you lots of maps with red dots. Uh, the only map with blue dots was the global map of the yes. other locations. Right? right. So the blue dots means the water wasn't hot enough. It, it, they didn't glitch. So it's not a question really. Do you have a sense of what toughness might be, or why some um, corals are able to withstand um, these bleaching events when neighbors are being decimated? Well, part, it's partly genetic. Um, so you see side by side um, colonies of the same species. Um, that's a question really for the physiologists. So there's lots of research being, being done on that. Um, I don't think anyone has the full answer. Uh, one's, one set of answers revolves around the Zosanthelli symbionts, and there's a lot of research being done on uh, other symbionts other than Zosanthelli, um, particularly bacteria. So the so-called holobiont is the whole package. Um, uh, and lots of people have looked at um, leaching resistance due to particular strain of Zosanthelli that occur within um, uh, but I, I can't believe it's not good. Um, I would just, would just say that the fact that a quarter of the corals died in a week seems to indicate that, um, that there's more to the story than just the source of the belly. So, um, coral mortality is actually quite complex. Let me just say a quick word about that. We measured it twice. Um, 
infant mortality at the, at the time of our initial underwater surveys to measure who was bleaching and who wasn't. And we also measured who, who was dying instantly. And again, uh, eight months later. Um, so bleaching mortality unfolds over a protracted period of actually years. So we talked about the corals being fragmented of the remnants. Those remnants are much more vulnerable to being overgrown by seaweed than the original adult coral was. The per capita predation rate goes through the roof if coral cover goes from 50% to 2%. And some of the remnant acropores at 2% coral cover were covered in drupella, which is a predatory snail, that home being on the only acropora in the neighborhood. Um, so it's more than just the physiology of bleaching, it's the, the whole mortality regime, a lot more disease. Um, and that unfolds in a pretty complex way over a period of a year or longer. These events are so fast, uh, how do the fish and uh, the wildlife respond to that? Okay, we're doing a lot of research on that. Um, so corals provide the habitat, and Acropora in particular is the most three-dimensional coral. The statues and the table corals provide the nooks and crannies for all the rest of the biodiversity, fish nurseries, and so on. So we've done quite a lot of research uh, in the past and currently on what happens to the, uh, the rest of the biodiversity when you lose a lot of corals. So for fish example, it's a spectrum of responses. So the fish people talk about winners and losers too, it's a catchy term. Um, at one end are coral dependent species like corallivores, the butterfly fish, the adultus. If you take away their diet, they, they either starve or move, they disappear. At the other end of the spectrum are fish who couldn't care less of all the corals in the world went extinct. Those are parrotfish, rolling herbivores. Um, many of the commercially important fisheries, things like coral trout, the Jennings use uh, the coral habitat as a nursery for juveniles. You don't see any immediate impact on the adults, but recruitment stops. So that with a time lag of maybe five years, uh, you then see the adult population depleting even on unfish groups because there's no throughput of fish recruits in the population. So lots of flow on effects often lag, uh, but basically if you take away the corals from um, you mentioned that it takes around 10 years for corals to recover. Um, I was just wondering if you could clarify that statement because I wasn't sure if it meant um, like it takes 10 years for the entire reef to regain its coral cover prior to disturbance levels, or does that refer to individual colonies recovering? And uh, does that apply just to the very reef or to reefs worldwide? The 10 year time. Okay. I'll give it a go. Let's bet nine You're you're right. Uh, there's a different trajectory for the recovery of cover uh, than say the recovery of assemblage structure. So I'll talk about cover, uh, and it would be cover to a different assemblage than the original one. If you lose a 50-year-old coral, it takes at least 50 years to replace it with another 50-year-old coral. So the 10-year trajectory is an optimistic one for the recovery of the fastest growing species that begin their early growth, like the flappers. And they tend to be acropora, which ironically are the most susceptible to <laughs> right. so it's, it's analogous to fire in a terrestrial landscape. Grasses are the weeds, but they are very flammable. Um, so they're not backed by a fire. <laughs> um, is that time frame specific to the Great Barrier Reef or to the Greek Um That would be fairly typical of shallow Indo Pacific reefs that are at the um, It's different in the Caribbean. Um, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 